I was working with the team. I was the boatman and one of the team leaders. Linda was with the team. Uh, in term, lightweight. What year did you start? The first year I raced was 1991. 1991 and, and, and through, through 2000. And, through 2000. And I can remember being out in the uh, out in the fields painting oars, getting ready to race. And it's a different. Uh, a lot of times people think rowers on the national team, they just roll in, everything's there. They get in the boat, they come off, they leave. It's nice. It's not like that at all. I mean, we're out there painting oars and, you know, waxing boats and putting docks together at the big races. It's, it's, it's a really interesting, I mean, in many ways, it's like high school rowing just taken up several notches. But the th same things happen. And Linda was, uh, we had great conversations. You did a great job. And Linda has an interesting perspective now at Harvard University. All yours. All right. Thanks. I, I, I thank Dave yesterday, or sorry, Mike, for uh, bringing the snow. You know, I'm from Boston, and I've been in Florida for the past week and a half and wanted to have that nice transition back, so the, the cold and the snow is good. Uh, how many of you are head coaches? And how many are assistant coaches? Okay, not bad. Head coaches, send your, your assistant coaches next year. Uh, one last question. Uh, any Raven supporters in here? Cause you're going to have to, uh, I am from Boston, so uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> we did not play well, it, and even if we had, it's hard to say what would have happened. So, um, Anyway, as I said, I'm just back from our Florida training camp. I was in Florida yesterday morning coaching, which was great. And one of the really nice things about being on a training camp is, is getting to know the team, getting, getting the pulse of the team, a little bit more than when they're, they're in classes and that sort of thing. And as a college coach, I probably have a few more luxuries than the, the high school coaches. Uh, the, the guys are always there. I don't, I don't have the parent issue quite as much. They're not dropping them off or picking them up every single day. Maybe I see them at regattas. They really want to know when the races are and what food they can bring. So it's not quite as, quite as uh, taxing as, as what you guys have to put up with. But being, being in the environment where we're all together, we had all four of our teams there, heavy men, heavy women, light men, light women. It was 186 rowers plus coaches. It's just a really big group. But you get to see what the other coaches think about your team. It's sort of like, you know, if you're looking at, at the boys, coach, boys boats, if you're a girls coach or vice versa, and you're like, you know, why, why do you have that person in the five seat? You know, it's always easier to coach somebody else's boat. And it's good to get that perspective. And when we're in Florida, we have the chance to, to see how the, the teams interact, see what they're doing. Because once you're coaching, you're on the water. You're not in the same room, so there's, there's not that kind of interaction that you have in other sports. And one of my colleagues who coaches on the women's team really thinks that I do a nice job with the, with the culture of the team. And, and being a freshman coach, that, that's kind of my job. I, I inculcate the team with the, with the culture sort of every year, and I start over again every year. And, and she just thinks that, that they have a really nice perspective and they, they interact well. And, and I'm flattered when she says that, so I figured I would try and, try and share a little bit of, of what we do. And one of the, one of the things that that we do right away is, or I do right away every year, is trying to set expectations. You know, what, what do I want from the team? I don't want a lot of drama, so I, I don't tolerate that. Um, most of what I do is a lot, of, a lot of using humor, although I've been told that sarcasm isn't really humor, but I warn the team that, <laughs> that that's what I do. That's unfortunately how I operate. Uh, but it's important for all of you to, to find your own voice, how you, how you engage your team. Setting expectations. Again, I, I, I'm pretty lucky at, at Harvard. Rowing is a, is a high-profile sport. Everybody wants to do it. The, the first day of, of classes, I have 80 guys show up, which is 10% of the men of the freshman class. So it's a lot. It's a lot. They don't all stick it out, but there's... I don't have to do a lot of sales to get people to show up once they're on campus. And I, I'm not going to talk about recruiting at all. Um, when, when we do get them going, though, I need to set expectations so that they know a winning culture. So 
I have that already, but most of my team has never rode before, so that doesn't really, they can't really process that we have a winning culture. They don't know anything about rowing. So I tell them, okay, this is what I expect you to be able to do, whether it's an erg score or a run or something like that. And then I post past results so that they can see that these numbers, these scores, these times, these speeds are attainable. Sort of like the four minute mile. Once, once one guy did it, then everybody could do it. So if I say, you know, it takes, you have to be able to break 18 minutes for 5K to be able to have a chance in the first boat. And here are all these novices who did it last year and the year before, and I can go back 12 years now and show that. It gives them some confidence that they can do it. And then show them how the team has done, you know, when we hit these standards. So, so setting expectations in terms of workouts. Some of the other expectations that, that we go are um, work with, aside from the, the work ethic, are respect for the team, respect for the competition. So I don't, I don't denigrate the competition. You know, we, we raise some very strong teams, and, and I don't talk them down or, or try to belittle them or say, we've, we've got to beat them because they're so-and-so. You know, we want to beat them because they're good competitors. We want to beat them because it, it's challenging and we need to work hard. So we want to have respect for the competition. We want to have respect for our teammates. And I tell them in, in no uncertain terms that, that this, is a, this is a tolerant environment. And I, I spell it out specifically. I don't, I don't beat around the bush. I say, if, if someone is going to, to use pejoratives of, of, and they're homophobic or they're racist or, or you, you can go through any, any ethnicity Whatever it is, we go through and it's, it's just not tolerated. And I tell them that in no uncertain terms. And if it becomes an issue and, I have, and someone says something, then that's it. They're off the team. And I do that right away. That's, that's the beginning. That's one of the first talks I do. And I de definitely address it a couple more times because they're freshmen. They're very close to high school age. Uh, some of them regress a little bit. So it takes, I figure it takes about three times for things to just start to sink in. And, and so there's, a, there's definitely addressing it right away, a preemptive strike, and then following up on it. And I, I stress to them that even if I'm not there, it's not okay to say, hey, and it's a, this is all guys, you know, oh, you roll like a girl. You know, that's, I'm like, tell them, well, you guys should all be as lucky to row as well as I do. But, <laughs> but that just because I'm not there or somebody's not there doesn't mean it's okay. And uh, we have, uh, do skits down in Florida and the guys know, all the teams do it and they know that I'm going to be there. But they don't really notice that I'm, I'm there. They're, they're all trying to show off for, you know, various people and other squads and that sort of thing. And, I know that, I do know, especially after this year, that they're, they're definitely listening to me. And uh, one of the other things that, that, you know, language is a big thing for me because the words are powerful and, and whether you're, you know, if you're swearing or, or using words yourself, you know, telling them, okay, you're, you know, come on, ladies, if it's a bunch of, a bunch of men, that's just, that's just not acceptable. And again, whether I'm there or not. And one of the one of the skits was was uh, pretty funny, and I I can't say all of the words because we are on the World Wide Web. And, uh, but they 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 brought up a translator, so they had uh, one of the guys was me, and you know, she says this is what Linda says, and and they had somebody who was the translator, and uh, they started out with, okay, we come down to practice, and I say, are the oars down? And the translator's like, are the oars down? So that was okay. And then, uh, so, where are the oars? Well, and that was, and then this is where I can't say it, you know, where are the blah, blah, blah oars? And, you know, insert all your favorite expletives. And they just, they just went on like this. And, uh, and they're talking about, yeah, I really like watching football. And it's like, GD Patriots, blah, blah, blah. And they're going on. So, so I know that they're listening. And they, they've, uh, they've kind of changed... Uh, you, they actually do know what's going on. The, the soundtrack that's actually playing when I'm, I'm saying where are the oars. And I, there was one other one where if the, oh, the coxswains, if they, uh, you know, I said, you've got to get the boats closer together. And that means, I dare you to hit. 
I dare you to clash blades. So the message is getting through, and I'm not raising my voice to them. I'm not swearing at them. And it's, it's my voice. And sure, there's the, the humor involved, as, as, as I see fit anyway. But they, they go through, and so they're, they're listening. And so your actions are very important. Uh, walking the walk, OK? Not just talking the talk, but, but going through. So uh, another way we, we show respect or be professional is on the bus ride to races, coat and tie. So this is my, this is my normal coat and tie attire. They, they've got their jackets and their, their blazers and their ties. And, and just doing that, you know, being, being respectful of them, being respectful of the competition. Uh, language, uh, working out. Um, I work out. I go to some competitions every year. It's, it sets a good model. Uh, you know, my boss says it's, it's important to be fit. And, you know, he's, uh, he was a lightweight, Charlie Butt, from, from nearby here. And he's pushing 200 pounds again, so he started, started exercising more. And uh, it's, just, it's just something we do to show this is how it's done. So modeling, modeling the, modeling the good behavior. And the, the flip side is, you know, some years I'll, I'll race at the Crash Bees or, or race at the head of the Charles. It's not a lot, but, you know, they, they know, they get excited about it. And even if they just see me working out or know that I'm working out, you know, what did I do today or, or what did I do? It, it's a little inspiring to them. I, it, it's certainly going to be that way for all of you, for your team. So that's, a, that's another way to, to model the, the good behavior. Uh, eating well. You know, unfortunately, we have to stop at the rest stops on the, the highway, and there's always the McDonald's or the Wendy's or the Burger King or whatever, and just trying to get them to make some, some good choices, and that's what I try to do when I'm there. So just, just showing them that or, or the, the moderation in alcohol. Obviously, nobody that I coach or you coach is legally able to drink, but my guys do, and so I, you know, I'm like, avoid shots. You know, that's, that's some of the advice. And when we're on the training trip and they're not supposed to be drinking, our whole trip was dry. And if, if this is, again, setting the rules ahead of time. If, if somebody's caught drinking or using drugs, or, that's it. It's game over. They go home. And if, if it's something like that on a training trip, they're off the team. This is not, you know, you're on campus and someone is, they get taken into the university health service or whatever. So I don't drink when I'm on the trip. They don't see me. It's sort of the, the flip side. Just because I'm not around doesn't mean they can be on bad behavior. Just because they're not around doesn't mean I can be on bad behavior. Uh, using the, the teaching moment. So sometimes you have to stop practice. Again, I can't always use the language just because I'm not comfortable using it. But we had a, had a practice a couple years ago. and. Someone was missing the clam from one of the oars, and so he coxed in at a couple extra by his feet and passing around. And one of the guys in one of the boats said something, uh, a pejorative term about women, uh, and one, referring to one of the guys. And, and so that was it. We were in the middle of practice. We're out there on the Charles. Uh, coxswain's way enough. We turned the boats around. We brought them into the boathouse, and then we sat down and talked about the language that was being used and what that means to me and what that means to the guys on the team. And you just have to be ready to follow through. And it, it's uncomfortable at times, and it, it can feel awkward and forced, but the, it really pays off dividends to make sure you follow through on that, that you really mean it. Other, other things in terms of setting limits or expectations, if, if you do have and al alcohol policy, and it's something that you have to set, or drugs, or missing practice, and everything doesn't have to be extreme. And you, you, you set what's going to happen if somebody does that. Are, are you going to follow through? You have to be ready to follow through. What if it's your stroke? What if it's your coxswain? Are you still going to follow through? It, these, are, these are young people, and, and the, the sport, a lot of it is about education, not just about winning races, I hope. And so you have to be ready. If you, if you set limits, you have to be ready to follow through. And, and the best thing you can do is to follow through. Sometimes it's, it's painful to keep somebody out of a boat for a week if that's, that's what happens. But everybody gets the message. That kid gets the message. And it, it just makes the team better. 
in, in my experience, to, to follow through that way. Uh, it, one of the, the other things would be, uh, let's see, oh, the, the teaching moment. So again, I, if it's, it's not okay, even if I'm not there, I, I freely post, put posters in my locker room. Again, coaching men, I have posters from our Office of uh, Prevention of Assault and uh, Violence Against Women. There's a poster I put in the locker room every year, 10 things men can do to prevent violence against women. Why not? It's, you know, they're, they're in college, they're learning. That's how I, I feel. I think it's important for them to know that and, and to be aware of things. You can pick your own pet projects if you got them or volunteer or whatever, but, but encourage them to see the, the broader picture because it is, it is an educational experience. Uh, in terms of boundaries, so a, a, lot of, a lot of the setting the team culture is, in, is engaging the team. This doesn't mean becoming their best friend. Okay, it's it's good to know what they're interested in. So some of the guys on the team will follow me on Facebook. They tweet. They they think I have funny Instagram pictures. It, it's good to to know what they're they're thinking and try to try to keep up a little bit. They're you know I'm plenty old enough to be their parents, almost their grandparents at this point. So might as well stay on top of things and and know what they're thinking but you got to be careful especially in high school if you're teachers you've probably been through the training I, I taught high school physics many many years ago for a brief stint and you've got the contact and by contact I mean bodily contact you know in rowing you want to move the person around and you've got to be careful you have to be aware this is one of these things, areas you have to protect yourself so you, you've got to make sure that, you know, okay, I'm going to move your shoulders. Somebody might be uncomfortable. I do this with my own team. And, you know, if they, you can look a little body language, but you're in a position of power and you don't want to take advantage of that and make somebody feel uncomfortable. So being aware of the, of the contact and, and sort of the last thing would be uh, your, in terms of relationships, you want to have a, a coach to athlete relationship, not something beyond that. And I think some of my... My best national team coaches, some of the best things I can say about them was they never dated any athletes. <laughs> and I had a successful career and it, it, it was good, but that's, that's really key, especially with, with young athletes, younger athletes, emotionally younger athletes, uh, making sure that, that they, don't get, they don't get swept up and, and you find yourself in an inappropriate relationship. Okay, I, I can't stress that enough, to, to don't date your athletes. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the most egregious errors somebody can make as a coach. Um, and I'll just, uh, just leave it at that. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm ready for questions and answers if we want to go there at this point. Absolutely. Uh, so three minutes here, and just real quick, and Charlie Butt, if you are watching and listening, I don't know if Linda meant to say your body weight, but it's out there. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some. Don't worry about that. So, uh, questions for Coach Linda, please. Um, when, when you were mentioning before about at the start of your season, you said you have all these athletes to show up. Um, how do you end up managing the expectations of, say, like recruited, experienced athletes versus blending them with a lot of walk-on and novice, like, and, and trying to get that whole dynamic to mesh? The, I have the same talk with everybody. They're all in the room to start with. The first five weeks of our rowing season the, the the recruits are rowing with the varsity guys so they're having a, a better experience now I, I think it would bring the novices along a lot quicker but it's really it's too many to have you know 50 or 60 guys who've never rowed before and to figure out who's going to figure it out and who's not going to so i do separate we do separate practice and i actually don't have to run those so i'm working with probably about more than well i have nine recruits so do the math so that's over 70 the first couple of days but it very, by the end of the first week, we're down to 50 easily. So that, that helps me manage it a lot. Other questions? Yeah, um, um, I was interested in um, what you had to say about setting, setting expectations at the beginning of the season, um, no drama. What happens when um, you have an athlete um, 
who is causing um, a significant amount of the problems within the squad and happens to be um, the, a, a very, very talented athlete, our best athlete, and um, uh, you know, could mean the, the difference having He's him wrong or for her. Me. Huh? He's wrong for me. And could be the difference of whether that boat goes to nationals or not. Um, I, I pull them aside and I say, look, these are the these are the problems that you're causing, and you can be part of the solution, or you can not be. You, you can keep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, but the last thing they want to do is have to miss practice. So I tell them they can't practice and they won't be able to race. It, it's, they don't want to miss practice. There's a lot of, lot of ways. If, if someone has to get to office hours for classes, I make sure to schedule practice so that they can make the office hours because otherwise they're not coming to practice if they don't go. Um, I coach novice boys. For the winter time, we have a couple of kids who have you know, shown up who haven't done rowing in fall, but other kids have. So similar to the veterans uh, of the question before. Um, but now that these are 14-year-old you know, kids and they haven't been to a boathouse even, how would you say to incorporate them into you know, making expectations and setting the culture? I think I rarely have someone start in the spring, and usually it's like one person or maybe two, but I would go through all the same sort of orientation that I did, and maybe if you can, some way spend, you know, three to five days a week with them maybe, just sort of getting them up to speed, and then just sort of plug them in. There's, there's probably going to be some other kids who are, even if they started going in the fall, are going to be in a similar uh, level of development, so you can, can work them in if that works. Coach Lindemere, thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck.